All right, folks. Uh, hello again. Thank you all, or some of you, I guess, for being here. Eh, about 100 of you. That's pretty good. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, hope you all had fun uh, learning about the joys of signatures and public and private keys. Um, and maybe, hopefully now our Piazza board can go back to normal a little bit so it's not inundated with all these insane uh, posts. Um, yeah, so... Uh, okay, so let's do logistics first, and then we'll go into assignment four, and then the next assignment. So uh, looking forward, so this is, the goal here is to help you kind of plan um, everything else going forward. So we have the tentative due dates for the next assignment. So assignment five will be released today, and uh, it'll be due on the 6th. And then on the 16th, we'll have an in-class CTF, of course. Um, I guess during class is probably the more appropriate way to put it, since we won't have it in class, but... and We'll um, get more into this as we get closer, but the basic idea is you'll break up into teams and uh, self-form into CTF teams, and during the course time, we will have um, a number of capture the flag style challenges, so a number of security challenges that your team will be um, fighting to solve during that time. Uh, it will be all kinds of things that we've talked about in class, so uh, it depends on where we are in class. Um, how big? I'm not really sure. I think I'm capping it at, let's say, five or six. I think that's probably a good size. Uh, if you have too big a teams, you're not really uh, learning anything. Um, if you have too small teams, uh, you can't learn from each other as well. So uh, we'll say probably around five or six uh, people. So those will be on the 16th and the 28th uh, that we'll have those. Uh, those should be pretty fun. And the other thing is that me, the TAs, and the undergrad TAs will all be available during to kind of help everybody get set up and get everything um, all ready to go. So, uh, when, you know, when you have questions during that and we're figuring out uh, exactly how that coordination is going to go down virtually, you know, obviously if we were still having class, uh, you'll have your own teams. Um, so if we were in class, we'd all be there in the classroom to kind of walk around and help you, but we'll be figuring out ways to do that virtually. So that should be pretty fun. And then we'll have, uh, towards the end of the semester, will be the last assignment, assignment six, that will be due. Um, and that's kind of the course from here. Um, at least that, those parts. Any questions on that? All right, so uh, let's go do assignment four. So assignment four was uh, due yesterday. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know, anybody want to give their thoughts on it or uh, if maybe, so I will say first off, there are some people who are still uh, doing the assignment and haven't gotten all their signatures. So if everyone would be so kind as to sign their keys so they could uh, submit the assignment late, that would be uh, very, helpful to them. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of reactions and it's okay. Everyone, uh, yeah, people are very, very sneaky. Um, surprisingly polite. That's good. How fake everyone's name sounds. Oh, their real names. Yeah, that's kind of funny. <laughs> um, Let's see, the scammer tried to scan me uh, to sign my adversarial key. It was possible to so. I was nice to people and they signed my adversarial. I didn't enjoy the assignment at all. Yeah, that's okay. These are all. Um, yeah, so the, you know, the interesting thing, um, yeah, 30 keys is a lot, but it's roughly, you know, less than 10% of the class. So that's kind of why I think it's a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, so the basic idea and so there's a couple different ways. I don't know if anybody wants to share their um, expert level, um, uh, how they kind of trick people to sign their adversarial keys. All um, What I'll definitely do is... So I have to wait a few days in order to grade the assignment because I need all the late keys to come in. And then what I do, I get them all. And usually what I do is I ask the person who was the best at uh, scamming people and getting signatures on their adversarial key to, um, to actually um, 
uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, to talk to the class about what they did and how they did that. Um, so yeah, so basically, so there was one thing, so somebody actually just mentioned here in the chat is, um, yeah, one of the techniques you can do is if people aren't very closely looking at the signature of the key, um, what you can do is you can change your UID to be your uh, name and then on your adversarial key. When you do that, all signatures on your key are then lost. So that's why normally you wouldn't do that because you'd lose the CSE 365 Spring 20 key. Um, but what you can do is what I've seen people do and what I think some people are talking about in the chat is you can create a, a fake CSE 365 Spring 20 key that obviously has a different fingerprint, but you're likely banking on people not checking it that closely. And what you can do is you can export to one output two different keys. So you ac export your fake CSE 365 key and your adversarial key that has your name on it now, but is no longer signed by the real key. And so when they import it, they import both. They check, they see that it's signed by CSE 365 Spring 20, but the fingerprint's different. So they sign it and send it back. So that's a um, kind of a classic way that people have done that. Um, yeah, or other one, that's a really cool idea. So you can, um, because it's all, these fingerprints are based on hashing, you can actually just keep generating keys that have very similar, and you should be able to possibly create one that has a lot. So somebody got five, the first five characters of the hash match. Um, when I gave my real key. Oh, that's funny. Um, yeah, so this is another thing. So this is the this actually happened a lot when people were um, submitting their assignment. So they would export their key and they would export their AS like use their email to export their key, which would end up exporting two keys, their real key and their adversarial key. So, um, so the same uh, thing happened here is if you uh, send them both and tell them to only sign one, but maybe tell them to sign your email key. Um, yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, how did the Discord go for people who are on there? It was good. Great for the first few days. Yeah, you think it was great until you figure out how many adversarial keys you signed people on there. You kept the adversarial keys out? Yeah, that's funny. Um, so here's here's a funny story I'll tell you that's happened in the past. So um, one time when I did this assignment, one of the classes decided to create their own um, basically like certificate authority. So there were two people involved and they would both check your actual ID to get onto a Google Doc list that they would put your name. And so they would trust anybody with that name on the list. Um, and one of the people actually scammed their way onto that list and into the certificate authority by tricking both the people, getting him onto the Google Doc and then either he changed it, I can't remember the details, but basically he tricked and got everyone that was part of the certificate authority who thought they all trusted each other to sign their keys. Um, yeah, someone edited the list. So yeah, this, uh, you know, when you're putting trust into, into a group, you know, all it takes is one person to come in and then they can get fake signatures from everyone in that group. Um, let's see, what are some other clever ways? Oh. One year, people um, created uh, a Python script to do the key signing, and they shared it with everyone. And they would even validate the key signature, like we were talking about. But they had a um, they put basically a back door that had their own fake key in there. So if they sent you their fake key, it would sign it. Um, yes, you'll find yeah, um, yeah. You'll have uh, you'll figure out. I'll send you the details about how many adversarial keys and everything. So how many real keys you you signed, how many adversarial keys, everything like that. Um, yeah, so that was a pretty interesting way. Um, I'm sure, and the other thing that's always really interesting is seeing how different communication uh, mechanisms, like if I had asked you, let's say two weeks ago, about what are all the, um, let's say, how does the security model of Piazza posts work? You probably wouldn't be able to tell me as well as now when you know exactly um, that other students can actually edit posts and um, <laughs> and could make them private. Um, 
Yeah, it's Piazza is a, a really weird uh, program. Um, so, uh, yeah, so yeah, Piazza has these really weird things. Uh, what they've done in the past, and I think what you guys started to do as well, was um, creating a post and saying like, okay, they can't edit the post, but they can edit, uh, they can at like nobody can edit comments. So they would just say like in the the post, it'd be like, look at comments. And then that's where they would, yeah, the follow-ups was where um, they would actually talk about things. Um, so yeah, there's no way to spoof the name and the class signature. Um, so if you were very, very careful of every key you signed and checked that the name was correct and that the class signature was on the key, you should not have gotten scammed. Or unless, like somebody said, you were checking, but they got the first five um, of the key fingerprint to match, and that's all that you were looking for. Yeah, they can... Yeah, why? Yeah, you know, you gotta... You don't want to have to do an alternate email. That's, uh, I think... Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, was the nature of that assignment. Um, cool. So yeah, there was, uh, you know, the, so the, the kind of goal here was to understand that the, how difficult it is to bootstrap this web of trust, especially when you have this adversarial element, right? So it seems to be pretty easy just checking, um, IDs. Um, yeah, you can email me anything you want. Uh, I'm happy happy to receive any emails um, uh, yeah and the other thing the um, usability will I sign your key maybe if depends on if it's a real key or not um, uh, the and the other idea is usability so part of the goal is to realize that these tools are not very usable at all um, they are really when you think about it kind of expert level tools right with all these kind of um arcane invocations of signing and exporting and sending keys back and forth um and so uh yeah that was kind of the other point of this assignment was to get experience with these tools that people try to and you can the other thing we didn't do with gpg keys but you can use them for um uh, sending encrypted messages to each other um That one's not, but there's, you know, a lot of other ones, especially if you have multiple keys. How do you select which one to sign it with? Uh, then well, you didn't talk about it here, but establishing trust. So putting trust on it. Um, checking fingerprints. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see there's like, uh, and you can even see this kind of like, um, there, like, narratives and counter narratives of like oh you sent me a key, fake key no you sent me a fake key and like people pretending to be somebody else um yeah it's uh it's pretty crazy so uh, anyways you'll get your grades on that you'll also get uh let's see going back here um the midterm so the midterm uh will release the grades probably monday or tuesday so it'll be very soon um so you'll get to see that. That should be, you know, very fun. Um, let's see. How often do fake keys get signed at real key signing parties? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think it just depends again on trust, right? So if somebody has an incentive to uh, trick you to sign their key, then as you've seen, even with, uh, I don't know, maybe depending on your perspective, it's either a lot or very little. Um, um, motivation here to trick somebody to signing it um you can you know it's pretty easy if people are not paying attention to trick them to sign things yeah and then the the time the exactly when you started the assignment was uh so starting early gives you a huge boost on this assignment Um, cool. All right. Well, let's move on to assignment five. Um, so assignment five, and we're now going to get into 
Um, and this is another assignment where starting early is going to be very important. Um, the idea is you're going to learn about password cracking, so specifically password hashes. So as we talked about when we talked about authentication, right? So typically the way that we know that passwords are done is rather than store the passwords in plain text, a hash of the password is uh, stored in plain text. So there'll be a series, you'll get a series of hashes and your goal is to basically reverse those hashes and figure that out. Um, there are a lot of uh, tools to do this. So things like John the Ripper, Hashcat, or there's a whole list here of Wikipedia password cracking um, software that you can use. And so what you do the, on Gradescope, there'll be an assignment called uh, Crack That Pass uh, Hashes. So what you do is just submit, just like we did on the crypto one, submit anything and it will give you your individual unique crashes. Uh, sorry, hashes, I keep saying crashes. Um, and so for part one is just MD5. So it's worth 40 points. It's a standard MD5 hash. And one of the things that's really important when you're doing this is to make sure you're doing this correctly. So you can check that Adam hashes to this hash and ASU hashes to this hash. So if you're writing your own hashing system or something or doing something custom, you want to double check that this works. Um, each of these parts has some kind of hint. So this says that it's a six character password. So what you should be doing is looking at the tools, understanding them, figuring out how do you tell it what you think the format of this password should be. Um, then part two is a So yes, password brute forcing. So you, you need to find a input that hashes to that same hash that you get. So it'd be somebody's password. So all you get is, oh, uh, if you don't know what type of password, the answer is yes. Uh, collisions, sure, are valid too, but I don't think you're ever going to find that. So I wouldn't bank on that. Like you have to think, is, uh, is it worth to search through this entire search space or is it easier to search through six character passwords to find the correct passwords? Um, let's see, what was the other question? Oh, if we don't, yeah. So in a real situation, usually you can tell. So you can see here that like MD5 has a certain length, uh, SHA-256 has a certain length, uh, Bcrypt has a certain format. So it all depends on that. Um, then part two is a SHA-256 hash. So you can check that um, it's a seven character password, so a little bit longer, but it's only composed of lowercase, uppercase, and digits. So you can reduce the search space much larger here. And um, part three is Bcrypt. So um, the idea is, uh, so here now the important thing of, um, of part three, so Bcrypt includes a salt in it. So the hashes will be the same. Um, so for instance, Adam can hash to any number of things, this or this ASU can hash to any number of things, this or this, uh, for this assignment, there's incredibly unlikely chance that there'll be a hash collision. Like, like I said, it's, it's, uh, less likely that you'll find a hash collision than you'll get the actual password. So if somebody just asked about passwords for this part. Um, the idea is that this is a commonly used password. So as opposed to the other two where you're trying to brute force and find a pattern, a uh, password that matches this pattern in part three, it's a commonly used password. So you should look in the, um, in the dictionary, uh, for that or in password lists or whatever. Um, okay. Now part four is, so in all of these parts, part one through three, you can, um, uh, you can use these off the shelf, uh, software, John the Ripper or Hashcat. Uh, for part four, part four, and it's only worth 10%. So, uh, I don't know if you only want 90%, you can totally ignore this, but this is a custom hash function. So it's not something that exists. It's something that we created specifically for this assignment. Um, so the idea is you take the input to hash and you run it through MD five a hundred times. So you take the MD five output, like in this case, um, if it's Adam, you take Adam, then you'd get this hash value and then you'd feed it back into MD five to get a new hash value and so on a hundred times. Um, and then you take that output a hundred times through SHA-256 and then that result a hundred times through SHA-512. 
Um, so a mathematical notation, if you want to think about it, it's kind of like this. So you're stacking 100 MD5s and then 100 SHA-256 and then 100 SHA-512s. And there we go. So you can then, the important thing is definitely for this one, because you're writing a custom hash function, uh, you want to double check that, hey, Adam hashes to this value, ASU hashes to this value, and security hashes to this value. Um, and in this one, you know, the intelligence here, you can see the search space is quite different. So uh, the user was very lazy and the password is five characters lowercase. So only five A through Z. And then the custom. So then uh, part five is extra credit, 10 points extra credit. It's the same uh, function from part four, but it's more difficult. And the more difficult is that no intelligence is available and none will be given. And okay, so yeah, so then to submit for this, all you need to submit for this part of this assignment is a readme. So submit a readme that has your name, ASU ID, and a description of how you broke reverse the hash and include the password that you broke for auto grading, right? So just do it um, uh, MD5 colon space and then put the password part one, SHA-256 colon space, password part two. If you don't do one, that's fine. Just remove it or uh, leave it out. That's totally good. Um, so Garrett's question are all character values um, used? Uh, that's, I'm not gonna give any information that's not on this page, right? So this is a six character password. This is a seven character password of lowercase, uppercase, and digits. So important thing, um, ooh, this should go away. Um, yeah, if you write code, submit it too, that's good. Or talk about it in the readme, that's fine. Any other questions? It, it'll be released at uh, noon, so after this class. Ha. Uh, extra credit if you break into my ASU account? I guess, I mean, you can change your grade to be whatever you want, so you can technically do that. And it would also be against the, uh, give us your password hash? Uh, no thanks. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, complete the assignment by using, yeah, you can use 100% all of the open source software. Um, yeah, so don't break into my account because I do not give you permission to do it. If you did it, I'm saying you could change my pass, uh, your grades. ASU would probably also likely fine you and kick you out for academic integrity violations. If they find you, yeah, that's always how crime works. Yeah, I'm not giving you permission. This is me explicitly not giving you permission. Correct. I'm explicitly telling you no. Cool. Uh, yeah. Well, and we have a recording of this, so, you know, I don't think that'll be any, yeah, we definitely have a recording. Cool. All right. So this assignment will be out. Uh, again, I think the best way to uh, do this is, uh, you know, start on this early. I think that's the really important part. Um, and yeah, get started on this early. Um, if it's, you know, five hours to the deadline and you try to start and it's going to take you 12 hours to brute force one of these passwords, I won't have any, um, uh, you know, not really any concerns there. You know, if you need to run this stuff overnight, um, it's, uh, you know, you got plenty of time. So start on it now, start playing with these tools, get used to them, maybe try hashing, you know, try breaking some of these passwords first and that should be good. Yes, Gradescope will tell you right away and it'll tell you exactly how many points you get. So Gradescope will tell you um, that they were correct. And uh, yeah, you can, you're free to use general, free to use every resource. I would say um, how many people can help. You're each gonna have your own uh, password. So I'm not sure other people would help as much. 
no, just like most assignments, uh, this is on your own. So you're free to use any resource or program to help you solve this challenge, except like directly for each other. Cool. All right, let's go back to networking. Uh, a VM is not terrible because depending on how it's done, it may use your system directly, so it should be fine. Cool. All right, on to TCP. All right, let me move this. That's not how that works. Okay, just a second. Let me get my windows arranged. What is going on? There we go. All right. Cool. Okay. So now we are talking about TCP. So, um, so now, and very different from, um, uh, very different from UDP, right? So we looked at UDP and UDP was essentially a very thin layer on top of TCP or on top of the, the IP protocol, right? So UDP didn't uh, give any guarantees of delivery, didn't give any guarantees of order or anything like that. We basically got no guarantees from UDP. Um, and so as we'll see that uh, TCP actually provides a lot of these things. So TCP um, is able to provide a um, connection oriented. So the idea is we'll be able to set up a connection between two IP addresses on the internet to be able to send data back and forth. Uh, so this is different. So then how does a, let's say something connection oriented, how does that differ from something that's just packet or datagram based like UDP? Yeah, it's a little bit different, right? So the connection, the idea of a connection is like, I can send some data, you get it, you can send some data back, and we can, maybe I can stream data towards you, but it's different from just sending like, here's a packet of data to you. So we'll see kind of exactly um, what that looks like in a bit. Uh, we also get now some features that we actually want. Yeah, we do get bi-directional, which is nice. Um, we get some really good features of reliability. So we actually get, uh, reliability. So that means that we can, um, one way to phrase this would be no loss. Another would say, um, maybe we can detect when there is loss. So there's no loss. There's no duplication of packets. Um, there's no transmission errors and everything comes in the correct order. Um, so the application, so what's nice is if we establish between two machines on the internet, a TCP connection, I can send you, um, so like I can send you some data, I can send first foo, and then I can send bar, and I know that you will receive it in that order. So you will receive first foo and then bar, even if these are sent in, as we'll see, different TCP packets. This is very different from UDP. If I sent you two packets, one after the other, foo then bar, there's absolutely no guarantee that you'll get it in the same order with UDP. So TCP adds this really nice feature. Um, it also uh, provides the port, the same port abstraction as UDP. So we have 16-bit ports. So again, this is why when we looked at um, ETC services, we saw that there were um, ports for uh, UDP and TCP. Um, and the really important thing, this is something will come up over and over again. It allows us to establish kind of a, a virtual circuit. So I'll just draw like host A and host B. So we have a connection between A and B, and we can A can send data to B, B can send data to A, and it's identified by this four tuple that will be very critical when we talk about this. So source IP, so if we think about it like this, source IP, destination, uh, I'll do it 
shorter source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. So this defines a connection between two machines. And what this allows is as long as one of these values is different, A and B can have multiple concurrent TCP connections and different virtual circuits with each other. And they'll know that they're different because they'll have either like a different source port or a different destination port. Um, so this is an incredibly useful feature. And that's, um, this virtual circuit, uh, so what this means, full duplex, is that data can, A can send data to B, and B can send data back to A. So it's a bi-directional stream where they can both send data to each other. Um, this uh, tuple of IP address and port is often called a socket, um, especially when you think of when you're um, creating socket programming, this is uh, what people are talking about. Um, so let's look uh, first at the packet and then we'll build up and we'll think about how this can actually be made to work. Um, so we need, just like UDP, we need um, source port and destination port. And then we'll see, we'll need, so this is, if you think about it, remember UDP basically just had source port and destination port on top of IP. But TCP, in order to deliver this kind of awesome uh, capabilities of using this virtual socket, we need additional information. And we're going to ignore um, for right now exactly what that looks like. Um, but again, kind of thinking about how these things um, in the, let's say, the Shrek model of networking, right? So we have the TCP uh, information fit inside the IP data layer uh, with an IP header and then that inside the frame layer for everything. Um, so. Um, so now how do, how can we even get that to work? So let's think conceptually here. So we have a and we have B and they want to establish a connection from one machine to the other. So they have IP addresses, right? So we have IP a, uh, so the things that we know, right? Let's uh, think about it that way. So IP A, uh, IP B, and so A ha knows its IP address, it knows B's IP address, and it wants to create a TCP connection to a specific service running on B. So then what does it need to know about that service in order to talk to that service in B? Yeah, the port number, great. So we need to know the port number. So we'll call it right now a destination port. Um, so for right now, let's keep it, um, so port 80 is HTTP. So yeah, A needs to know not just who to talk to, which is IP address, but it needs to know precisely which of these 65,000 whatever ports is it trying to talk to. Um, now, if we think about this, so um, so if we think about this, A knows its IP address, it knows B's IP address, and it knows the port it wants to talk to. And so what A needs to do is somehow start the conversation. So uh, another way to think about this is, um, you know, you can also think about this in terms of clients and servers. Is that even spelled right? Whatever. Um, so B has some service running on port 80 that A wants to access. So A is going to be the one to initiate communication. So A is going to have to send a packet, uh, a TCP packet, and we'll get into the details of what that packet looks like. But we can think of it, and we can actually even think about what kind of information. Um, so we know... Uh, the source IP and the destination IP is, the source IP is des uh, IP A, the destination I IP is IP B. And then if we think about what we know at the, um, at this layer, we know at the TCP layer, um, we know destination port because that's port 80. But what about for source port? Yeah, 
Yeah, we can choose any. We can pick any source port we want, as long as we don't already have a service running on there or somebody listening on there. But uh, we'll do one, two, three, four, five. Is that right? Yeah. So it needs to be something that uh, it's not strictly any, it's any port that's a does not already have open. So if you think it needs to have this tuple of source port, source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port. So a will use this for information in order to um, think about it. So or in, in order to um, identify this communication. So it knows when it gets a packet back um, from B, to a uh, two port one two three four five des uh, source port eighty that um, uh, uh, let's say so I'll also how about this we'll say uh, late assignments don't get adversarial keys how about that. Um, okay, so basically A will have to send some packet from A to B that establishes this communication, right? And if you think about it, this is kind of a packet that says, hey, I want to start talking with you. So B receives this packet. Um, B receives this packet and it needs to... so. It says, okay, um, I look at the destination port. I see, do I have somebody running on port 80? If I do, then I will uh, continue that communication. Um, and let's see. So now B will need to respond. So B will uh, respond with, uh, so it has to send a packet back. So we know the source, let's say, uh, Let's say source IP. What's the source IP here? B. Destination IP. IPA. And then uh, what's the destination port? Perfect. And the source port? Cool. Okay. So now B sends this back. Right? So, but we're at actually a bit of an impasse here because right now these packets look identical. Right? So this packet from A to B is A requesting to be, hey, I would like to start communicating with you. Whereas, how's that different from the second packet? No, oh, conceptually, we haven't even talked about that. So, yeah, it's a reply, right? It's a reply to that original, that initial packet, right? So, and if you look at these packets in isolation, they look exactly the same, right? B, what if B wanted to start a communication with A? Right, so if B wanted to start communicating with A, well, these packets look the same. So how would A be able to tell? Oh, this is a reply to my packet, and not a new trying to establish a new connection. Um, so we need some way of um, doing that. So uh, luckily, we have this nice. Uh, we have these nice flags uh, in this in the header that we can set. Um, so the flags are super important. Um, the difference between clients and servers is just a matter of perspective. So, so for right now, B may be the server, but that doesn't mean that A isn't running things that are listening for incoming connections. So what we need is we can use these flag to set different flags, 
right? So this flag, a sin flag says, hey, and only a sin flag says, hey, I want to establish a communication with you. And then we need some way to reply. And we can say, oh, uh, okay, great. I got your reply. Uh, I got your initial request. Oh, no. Hmm. Not much I can do about that now. Um. Let me see. Maybe there's. What if I just kick all of you out of the Zoom? Um, I, so I'm also not using Zoom's recording. I'm recording locally, so you'll get all of my good uh, audio here on the recording uh, that we post. Um, but okay, so yeah, I will repeat that. Don't worry. Um, okay, so what we need is we need to start uh, sending this connection and we need to identify, be able to identify different packets and how they, um, what they are. So in this case, the sin flag here says, hey, I would like to establish a new connection with you from A to B. And if B approves of that, they can send back a SYNAC packet. So they can say, hey, I, I'm acknowledging that I got your SYN packet. I would like to establish a communication with you. Um, now, so um, synchronization and acknowledgement, I believe. Let me see. It's in this. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so now at this point, so at this point, the question to ask yourself is, can A and B start communicating now? Right, it seems like yes, because they've already established a communication, right? But the question is why, rather than what's going on. But the question is, why can't they actually establish? And the really important thing that will help when thinking about networking is you always have to think about it from just one person's perspective. So in this case, where's my... Cool. So in this case, from A's perspective, right? A sent a packet to um, A sent a packet out um, said hey I would like to start a communication right by setting this sin flag so this is saying hey I would like to talk to you right and how does it know that B is even up right so before it establishes a communication it needs to know a couple things is B up does B want to talk to me right is there even anything listening on port 80 if there's not anything listening then I can't have a communication with them. So for A, A doesn't know, and A mean, may need to, maybe the other thing we need to think about is, did this packet, if even if B is up, did this packet go away, get dropped in, in the communication? Because remember, we're using the IP layer, which has absolutely no guarantees that this packet will ever make it to its destination. So A sends the packet out, great. And then it gets this response from B, so at this point, it knows when it receives the SYNAC packet, when A receives this packet, it knows, oh, great, B is up. It wants to talk to me, specified by the SYNAC. And so then I can commu continue the communication. So that sounds great. But if we think about it from B's perspective, right, what did B get? Well, B first got this initial SYN packet from A that says, hey, I would like to establish a communication with you. B says, hey, that sounds great. I would love to chat and sends this SYNAC packet back. But at this point, B has no idea that A ever gets this acknowledge this uh, SYNAC packet. It has no idea that um, it's actually up and receiving all of this communication. So like maybe A went down. So if it tried to talk to A, what's the point if it never received that? Or what if it B starts trying to talk to A but A said, hey, I never received your SYNAC packet, so I thought you were down, and we didn't talk at all. So, synchronization. Um, so, the, yeah, so the idea here is we need, we need to have a third packet, right? Because everybody needs to get a response back from the other side, 
in order to know that this actually happens. So to complete this cycle, um, yeah, so now A needs to send a packet back, uh, source IP, IPA, uh, destination IP, IPB, destination port 80, and source port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And this will be just an ACK packet to acknowledge. Oops. So remember, at this point, A knows that B is up and wants to talk. So this packet is really about B knowing that A agrees to this communication. And so, as people have mentioned, we have actually a very nice three-way handshake um, that establishes this communication. And the um, and so this is one of the critical things about understanding TCP, how it works and why it works, because at this point, now, once B receives this ACK packet, they both agree that they're up, they want to talk, and that they can send data to each other. And so really important to understand this gets asked almost if you get into any kind of interview or anything and they're asking you anything about networking, uh, SYN, SYNAC, ACK. These are kind of, uh, you should deeply ingrain these into your mind and understanding of networking. But it's important to not just understand kind of by rote what the three phases are. What's more important is understanding why. Like Why do we have these um, important things here? So SYN, SYNAC, ACK uh, is the three-way, TCP three-way handshake. Um, cool. Awesome. Okay, so now that we've established the communication, so we've done the three-way handshake, and we can establish now some communication, how do we send data? Sorry. Um, and again, kind of the, the interesting thing here is to keep, you know, putting yourself in the minds of these designers, these people who created these uh, network. Um, uh, why can't A send Synac immediately? Because it hasn't received the reply from B. So it doesn't know if B is up, so it can't send um, anything yet. Right? Because both sides need to have received a packet and sent a packet, or sent a packet and received a response. So, for instance, here, A sent this SYN, got a SYN ACK back. B sent a SYN ACK and needs an ACK back in order to each know. So SYN, SYN ACK, ACK. That's the three steps. Now we want to send some data, right? So let's think about this. So, okay, now A wants to send some data. Uh, so this is, let's see, port 80, uh, get slash HTTP one. Mm, I always forget how this one goes. So let's say, um, a wants to send this data in some TCP packet. So A wants to send this to B, right? So we actually know exactly how we can get this to happen. We do source IP, IP A, destination IP, IP B, and I'm gonna have to redo that, that's fine. Destination port 80, source port 345. Uh, we'll get to it. I'm deliberately not putting in anything in there for now. Right? So A needs to send this over to B. So we have a couple of, and then let's say. So at this point, B gets this, right? But we, if we go back to the guarantees that we have here, right? 
a reliable stream delivery service. So what this means is how does Uh, we'll be getting into that. There's a reason why. You'll see it in a second. Um, we need to get there. It's a specific, it's this very specific step two packet is why. Um, okay. So let's go here. Let's think. Okay, so we send this, but how do I get reliable? So A sends this packet. How does it know that B received it? Or how does it know that this packet got lost? Maybe it needs to send the same packet again. Yeah, so we can kind of use the same type of idea and the other side can say, uh, Right, And this is kind of the fundamental part here of networking is we need something back from that other side that tells us they actually received what we sent. Because until that point, we have to consider this packet lost because we have no idea um, how it got there or if anybody uh, came back. Uh, port 80. Cool. And we'll call this an ACK because we want to acknowledge that we received something. So I can send this back. Now, um, so, okay, so this could work, and then we could send maybe more data to, to B and then get an acknowledgement back. The question is, um, what if I sent two packets? So it's a stream, right? So a stream means I can send uh, as many packets as I want. So I can send, I should be able to send a packet like this. So I should be able to send these two packets, right? A should be able to send this one, then this one. But now B, Let's say this first one is dropped. So this first one never happens. Sorry, it says my connection is unstable. How's the audio? Okay. Cool. Let me know if it's not. Um, now, how can B say, hey, uh, well, you sent me two packets, or maybe I don't even know. Like, what do I acknowledge that was the last thing I've seen from you? Right? So in this case, if we just had our simple scheme, this packet would get dropped, and now they have two different views of how data is flowing on this on this network, right? A thinks, hey, I've sent I've sent this and this. So if we if we think about it from the data perspective, right? A would think I sent this uh, get slash h. Uh, host example.com and B thinks that they just sent host example.com right so we need yeah we need some kind of like indicators or something that says hey this is how um, this is how the data that I'm I'm sending to you so we need actually more information and we need to kind of um, so essentially what happens I'm trying to think of where the best way to do this is So this is where, if we get back to our segment here, uh, we have two really important parts of the packet, the sequence number and the acknowledgement number. We'll think about just the sequence number for now. Um, so what I would do is, uh, Okay, so what I'm gonna do is now every packet that gets sent that says as part of its sequence number, where is this, if you think about it, 
in the, the flow of packets that I'm going to send. So this first one will have sequence number zero. And this next one will have zero plus the size of the data that we've sent. So this would say sequence number would be in this case. So let's see, it'd be one, a zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 for a new line. So this tells the other side where in the packet stream of data that I'm trying to send, where does this data fit? Right, so this would says at zero put get slash HTTP 1.1, and this would say uh, sequence number 15. So the cool thing is, what would happen is, um, now when I acknowledge, I'm not just going to acknowledge, I'm gonna use the acknowledgement number to say what I've seen in your, um, in your other side. Uh, so we'll talk about when we're done sending that involves tearing down the connection. It's a pretty easy process. Um, and we'll talk about overflow in one second, but it won't matter, which is cool. Um, so we send, let's see. So we send these two packets. And now let's say this packet gets lost. So when we receive this first packet, we will send an acknowledgement an acknowledgement number to say, hey, we've seen uh, 15 bytes, so I'm expecting the next bytes that you send me are starting at 15. And the acknowledgement flag will be set, so that's why we'll set the ACK on there. Um, now, when A gets this packet back, so A at least thinks at the start, well, hey, I sent all this data, right? But B actually received only half of it. But when A gets this packet back, it now knows exactly how much of what it sent B got. So it can say, oh, it's got up to 15. So that means it's got all of this first data. So what it can actually do is resend that data because it knows that that data didn't make it to B. So B will say, okay, you've got up to here. Well, let me, great, let me send this packet again to you. Oops. So it will create the same packet and send that on over. Now, one really interesting thing, and this is what we talked about a little bit, is, yeah, so the interesting thing is, okay, so let's go over the second question. Yeah, so what happens if the second packet is dropped? Um, so, but at least let's, let's go through this example really quickly. So we can go, this happens. Right, we send a packet back, but now we're acknowledging uh, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 27, oh no, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to do this. 33. This now, when uh, B sends this back, now at this point, A knows that they've both received the exact same information. So now in this way, we've been able to acknowledge to say, hey, I've seen all up to 33 bytes that you've sent me. Okay, does this example make sense? Cool. So now, uh, now we can take the example of what happens if this first packet gets dropped, right? Like in our previous example. So when this first packet gets dropped, so um, this is great. So we get this packet. Now, I guess in some sense, right, B has a question. Do I acknowledge 33? Because I see 15 here, and I say, okay, this starts at 15. I've seen this much. I have all acknowledged 33, but how does it know, how does B know that it lost this initial packet? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so it needs to, we actually need to go back further to the, to this part. We need to actually establish what's gonna be our acknowledgement and sequence numbers as part of this process. So what happens is we don't just send a sim packet. And uh, as we'll see, it actually gets into security. We don't start at zero, but, um, well, uh, I messed it up by starting at zero, but that's fine. Um, so what we do is when we start here, this tells B, hey, I'm gonna start talking at essentially at zero. Uh, we'll get to it, don't worry. Um, but at least here, now when we acknowledge, when we send a sin ack, so we say, so uh, the cool thing is B will choose its own random sequence number, uh, let's call it 9090, and will acknowledge one which is not what we'd expect. And then let me just finish this up and we'll uh, talk about why these things are the way they are. A, B. Cool, okay. So this is actually what happens as part of the initial um, TCP handshake. A creates its own sequence number. So again, this actually gets back into, we talked about why we have sin, sin ack, and ack. It's here there's no acknowledgement number. Here there's an acknowledgement number. And here there's also an acknowledgement number. So anytime you have an acknowledgement number, you also include the ack flag. But okay. So A, A generates a, so let's take this step by step, right? A generates a random starting sequence number and sends a sin packet to B. Um, B acknowledges that by sending back the sin number plus the, the sequence number of A plus one. So super interesting thought. Why do they do plus one here? Because as we've seen further on, right, the sequence numbers move when we send data, but we're not actually sending any data here. So why would it do this? It seems kind of crazy and it seems kind of silly when you look at it. So it actually has to go, if we look at this, um, so if we look at here, yeah, so in some sense it needs to acknowledge that it received the packet, but the interesting thing is, so the case, so the acknowledgement number is a 32 uh, bit number. The question comes into, so it would be very easy to take that acknowledgement number that, or that, sorry, the sequence number that you got and put it as your acknowledgement number, right? But as we've seen, what we need to be able to do is increment that number to say, I've got this much data. Now, how much do you remember about endianness? None. Everything. Nothing. Everything. Cool. Um, the question is, we have a 32-bit, right? These are just 32 bits. So we can represent that as, uh, let's say, I don't know, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, right? If we think about the hex values here, right, of this number, so 0 through 8 bits are here, 0, 1, 8 through 16 is here, 16 through 24 is here, and 24 through 32 is here, right? But this may be how they're laid out in on the raw packet, but ending in this, I don't, did I misspell this? That's fine. Um, the problem is how do you interpret this as a number? Right, the question is, and specifically where is the most significant bit? Is it, uh, let's see, view programmer, right? Is it, uh, if we think about it in this hex, 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04? So here, the, um, and to be perfectly honest, I can't remember all the difference. I think this is little Indian. 
if the biggest byte is in the least spot. Um, but this would be the number, um, this would be roughly, what is this, uh, 16 million. But in the other Indian-ness, right, in Big Indian, 04 is actually the most significant byte, and then the second most significant byte. So when you interpret this as a number, it's actually 04, 03, 02, 01, which is 67 million. So that's Little Indian. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, so this is Little Indian with this being um, uh, as the most significant and these as the least significant. Um, the So the interesting thing is computers internally do this differently. So different CPUs, as long as it's the same, as memory, as data is stored in memory can have different um, Different machines can have different endianness. But here we're sending a number along a network from one machine to the other. So we wanna, it's actually a um, de debugging feature of doing this plus one. The idea is can the other side add one to this number? Does it actually uh, interpret the endianness of these numbers correctly? Um, because if I remember, I think the acknowledgement number in network order, I think is big Indian. But most systems like x86 and x86-64 are little Endian systems. Um, so anyways, this is just a, a super interesting technical detail of why you have something that looks silly of adding one to a number. But it's to prove to the other side, hey, we can both actually talk to each other because we speak the same language. Um, and it's a nice way to do that here before you've established a communication and everything starts breaking down. Um, so it happens here. Anyways, I thought it's really cool. The other cool thing is on the synac to ACK side, the same thing happens. So the sequence number of B and the acknowledgement number. And so this is how, this is actually then one of the important parts of the TCP handshake is setting up the sequence numbers of both sides of the communication so that everyone knows what to expect. Uh, if this check fails, they would just tell you to reset and go away. Um, yeah, it would send a packet that says, with a flag that says, hey, go away, I can't talk to you. Like, I don't understand what you said. Um, cool, so now through this process, now we have the initial acknowledgement, the initial sequence number of both sides. And that is how, we'll have to change these slightly. Um, so here we have 15, 16, uh, 1, 16. And here we'll have 34. So now if we go back to this scenario, so A sends its first packet with sequence number one, the second packet with sequence number 16, the first one fails. And so now B knows, so you think about uh, both A and B, right? Once they're done, it basically says, um, it says, oh, B is at 90, uh, 90 91. And B thinks, oh, A is at one. That's what I'm expecting. So what they're acknowledging is if they get something that's out of order, they acknowledge what they've seen up till now. So in this case, instead of acknowledging 34, it'll say, hey, I'm looking for whatever's at byte one. That's what I'm looking for. And then when... Um, when A gets this, it says, oh, B's only acknowledged my very first byte, which means it hasn't acknowledged anything. So I actually need to resend this packet. So it'll say, great, okay, let's send this packet out. Uh, this is at sequence number one. It'll basically resend this whole packet. Uh, that will go to B. B will then acknowledge up to, what do we say, 16? And then at this point, now A knows that they've both seen up to this part of what they've what they've sent. And then now B can finally send the remaining packet, or sorry, A can finally send this remaining part over to B. B will get that and acknowledge uh, that they've seen that. And It will send it back, and this at this point now A knows. Oh, great! We've both seen everything we need to see. Boom, 
There we go. Uh, let's see. Okay. Is there a... We'll talk about sin scanning later. Don't worry about that. Um, uh, so even though B got the second one, yes. So A will need to send it again. So B will typically not store that. Um, it may or may not. It kind of depends. Um, yeah. So every layer checks every checksum. So there's no UDP layer here because TCP. So we have uh, IP and the TCP layer. So every layer actually has a checksum. So there's a checksum at the TCP layer. So if any of the checksums fail, then it will throw the packet away and not use it. So it's just the same as it never appearing there. Yep. And cool. OK, so yeah, this is uh, literally how everything starts. Um, so if the, oh, good question. So if the packet from B is lost, so let's say, um, uh, let's go, this packet never arrives. Uh, a has a timeout, basically, where it sends packets, it waits for an acknowledgement. If it doesn't get an acknowledgement in that time, it will resend the packets. Because it knows that this doesn't isn't going to have duplication because B will only store one copy because of this sequence number. Right, so this is exactly you can think of where does this data fit in my stream? Cool, okay. So, it's a good example. Uh, let's see if there's a, okay, other flags that are, um, so we talked about uh, starting things or turning things off. So fin is a request to say, hey, we're finished. So. A reset basically says, I have no idea what you're doing. Um, something has gone horribly wrong, so I'm killing this connection. Um, push is trying to say, oops, uh, push is trying to say, hey, send this data up to the client, but it's really more of a request than anything else. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me get there. Okay, good. We went over that. Uh, initial sequence number, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, yeah, here's an example that we can walk through of the three way handshake. So we have a client sending a SYN packet to the server. So we can see the SYN flag is set. So we know this is starting a communication um, with its own sequence number. Uh, port 22 would be, I believe, SSH. Um, the server will reply back with a SYN ACK packet with a this, um, acknowledgement number of the sequence number increased by one and the sequence number, a new sequence number. And the client will acknowledge that. And now we have this three-way handshake. Um, and cool. Okay, so we can talk about uh, data being sent. So here you can see an example of um, one side sending 25 bytes from one side to the other. And this is the very cool thing about the um, either side can talk to each other. So the server can reply back to us, acknowledging what we sent and sending data. So it's saying, hey, uh, so it's acknowledging, if you look at the sequence number here, it's acknowledging that it got those 25 bytes. And by the way, here's 30 bytes that should be at sequence 7612. And then the client will acknowledge, hey, great, I sent you up to uh, 6600. And I acknowledge that I've read up to 7642. Um, so yes, because it's a, um, so to answer Micah's question, because it's a, um, a two-way communication, the uh, either side can send a fin packet to just close one way of the communication and the other side can still send data. So shutting it down, um, basically you send a fin flag, you acknowledge it and um, B will shut down when it thinks it's ready. So we can continue this with the shutdown. So here the client says, hey, I'm gonna send a fin packet to say that I'm done and I'm not gonna send any more data to you. The server can, the other side can still respond. So this is the uh, full duplex, like either side can send data. So the server can send more data, the, and then finally um, can send a fin packet and the client will acknowledge that. Uh, I guess the other important thing is the, the client will acknowledge uh, any of these, the data that it gets from the server, but it's never gonna send additional data. Yeah, cool. Okay, so great questions. We will uh, stop here. Uh, no, there's no limit of three flags per packet. The flags are a series of bits, and each one being set uh, doesn't matter. Um, yeah, so exactly. So Stephen asked a great question. We're going to get into that very soon of what this implication means, and specifically what does it mean if you can guess the sequence or acknowledgement number? How does that impact the security of this communication? 
Uh, so we'll definitely be talking about that. We'll talking about port scanning, all that fun stuff. So yeah, we covered a lot today, but you got the uh, basics and there's, I'll say there's a ton more complexity and interesting parts to TCP that we're not going to touch. Like um, how do you deal with bandwidth and uh, fairness issues and all kinds of stuff, losing packets, all these kinds of things. So, but the basics are here and this is all we need to know to, in order to understand this and analyze it from a security perspective. Um, so assignment five will be out in 15 minutes. Uh, good luck. Start those hashing. And I, uh, yeah, please help uh, people out for signing their keys. That would be very, uh, you know, nice of you to do that. And yeah, I will see you all on Tuesday. Welcome, welcome, welcome to... It's still on. <laughs> Oh, now it's still recording. <laughs>